Welcome. My name is William Porter McRoberts, MD, and today we're talking about neuromodulation. This is Neuromodulation University, Chapter 1. Today we're going to talk about uh, neuromodulation in general, an introduction to it. How does it work? Where does the electricity go? What does it feel like? Does it hurt? What can and it do and what can't it do? Uh, why does it work? Why doesn't it work? And how long has it been done? Um, I'm an interventional physiatrist living here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Neuromodulation is, in short, spinal cord stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation, peripheral nerve field stimulation, and ultimately uh, deep brain stimulation. It's about using electricity to impart relief or a change in sensation uh, and ultimately a change in the ability to live life um, to you. It is a uh, divided into the aforementioned topics, that being spinal cord stimulation. It's the implant of, a, of a, a series of electrodes in a lead inside your spinal canal. Done under a fluoroscopic visualization, that means a small uh, x-ray, that's uh, used to place these small leads, just like a pacemaker lead, inside your spine. There's uh, essentially two ways to go about doing it. There's a, a trial process and ultimately a permanent implant. And the trial process is something that we do to uh, allow you to test drive the procedure, test drive the, uh, the feeling, and then ultimately see if it's worthwhile so that you can make a decision um, at the other end, so to speak, to whether it's going to be beneficial or not. The trial is, is uh, very important. It's one of the few things in medicine that you can actually test and see if you like it before you make a decision whether you want it or not. It's unique to, to this. You can't do that, of course, with a, with a knee replacement or a cataract removal. Those are things you just have to dive into and, and hope for the best. But with, with neuromodulation, with spinal cord stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation, you can actually test it out first, not put in the actual device, uh, but put in the leads only through a little needle, and then see if it's something that works. How does it work, specifically? What happens with, with a neuromodulation lead? We put in a small lead, it's only about 1.1 1 .1, uh, millimeters thick, and we put it down and along a nerve, be it the spinal cord or peripheral nerve uh, inside your body. Then small pulses of electricity are, are sent through the electrodes. These impart uh, energy to the, the, the nerve in question, and the on-off nature of the, the electricity, turning it on and off very rapidly, sometimes very fast, up to maybe a thousand times uh, in a second, maybe even much, much more, 10,000 times in a second in some instances. But nevertheless, this uh, modulates the nerve, paces the nerve, if you, if you will, and it provides what I call electrical anesthesia to the nerve and everything distal to it, that being things downstream. Uh, so if we were to uh, stimulate the nerves in your shoulder, it might be the, the pain in your, your hand or arm that is, uh, that's ameliorated or, or lessened. The idea is, uh, is an analogous to use of a uh, peripheral nerve block, such as uh, a use of lidocaine or, or bupivacaine, something that a dentist might use in numbing up a nerve uh, or, or for something for a tooth, a toothache. The problem with using... Uh, these types of medicines long term is that they simply wear off and we cannot anesthetize say the sciatic nerve forever it just doesn't work we can't uh, do it and the body will will eat up all that medicine and uh, the pain will return as well as the feeling and thus the pain with electrical anesthesia the the anesthetic continues as long as the electricity does and so the idea is to place this thin little lead down next to the nerve provide this pulsatile electrical signal uh, reduce the pain in the nerve and do it for as long as there's electricity flowing. To do that, it requires at the present time the implant of uh, something called an internal uh, pulse generator or IPG. And this is much like a pacemaker. So what happens during the trial is we simply put in the little leads, no pacemaker, and then uh, allow you to try it, test it out, do what you want to do, uh, run, walk, pick up your grandkids, uh, see if your pain is better. And then um, if it is indeed much, much better, pull out the leads uh, approximately a week later. And then uh, we take you to the operating room and uh, implant uh, the whole unit um, operatively, making a small incision for the IPG and putting the leads back in and then connecting it up underneath the skin. 
The electricity is interesting. It goes through the path of least resistance. And so this matters because the, the path of least resistance is usually from one electrode to, to the next, but it goes also through a nerve and near a nerve. And so it'll stimulate the, the outer surface of the spinal cord. Usually just the last uh, millimeter or so, kind of like the skin on an apple gets stimulated. It feels like, uh, somewhat like a TENS unit, but uh, much, much, much more intense and, uh, and more complete, I should say. I've had, never had it myself actually, but uh, talked to hundreds of patients with it as I've implanted hundreds. And um, there have been several different stories that seem to capture the feeling quite well. One, one patient explained um, <clears throat> the feeling as being like a TENS unit or, or more like a symphony. She said, prior to stimulation, the, the, the feeling of pain was kind of like having someone screaming at her all the time, uh, uh, taking her attention away from important things, and, and it was loud. Bringing the stimulator in took that person and put them way far off in a field, say, you know, a couple hundred yards away, and yet between her and the, the painful screaming was now a, a violinist playing a soft music. And it was the, the trade, if you'll have it, as of the, the pain for another sensation. And this sensation is the sensation of the stimulator. We term it paresthesia. Paresthesia is, uh, is this kind of electrical numbing sensation which is uh, controllable by you, but uh, it's the, the replacement sensation for the pain. A lot of patients ask, does it hurt? And uh, the answer is no. Paresthesia certainly uh, doesn't hurt. Some people are, uh, maybe one out of a hundred don't like it for some reason. Uh, more, more importantly, does the procedure itself hurt? And to that end, yes, it does hurt some. And what we're going to be doing during the trial is placing a needle inside the spine, <clears throat> much like an epidural. For this, you're, you're largely awake and we just use local anesthetic. But it does hurt a little bit. Um, it probably hurts along the, the root of an IV, but everyone is different. Um, most patients are tolerated very well. Um, then we leave the lead in, take the needle out uh, right after the procedure is concluded, and uh, leave the lead coming out through the skin, clean it, and then secure it to the skin. There's irritation of, of the muscles sometimes. It hurts sometimes to have the lead going through the skin and the muscles, and it's not the most comfortable thing in the world, that's for sure. Um, patients, the gross majority of the time, are able to differentiate the pain of their uh, the chronic low back pain or leg pain from the pain of the procedure. And usually people who are in chronic pain uh, mark the, the pain of the procedure as being vastly less than the pain they're dealing with. But, but yes, to answer your question, it does indeed hurt some, uh, but entirely uh, reasonable amount of pain. With the implant itself, we're making a small incision, approximately two to three inches to allow the insertion of the, the generator. It's sore too. Um, on a scale of one to 10, it's hard to say. Comparatively to other surgeries, Think of another small surgery that you might have, a removal of a skin cancer or uh, uh, something like a knee replacement would be vastly more painful, for example. But nevertheless, it does hurt some, but it's certainly not something that cannot be managed. And uh, we make every effort to make it as pleasant uh, or uh, a, a process that's as least painful as possible. That's our whole rationale with pain management. What can I and can't it, uh, I do and what can it and can't it do? These are two good questions. Uh, the one, first one pertains to you. Uh, what you can and can't do during the trial is you can't get up and run around. You cannot do things that could jar or move the leads. Uh, for example, riding a pogo stick would be something you wouldn't want to do. Going for a run on hard concrete or uh, go skydiving. Anything that doesn't jar the leads, for, for example, uh, taking a walk or uh, even uh, going for a drive or taking a uh, a walk with your, your spouse or your children, it's not going to move the lead at all. You can certainly do that. And what can and can't you do after the implant? You, after the permanent implant, you need to take it easy for, I would say, four to six weeks. And uh, that allows for scar tissue to form. Once the scar tissue is formed, then you can really get back to things you want to do. Really, after about three months, it's very well scarred in, and you can return to all of the naughty things that you wanted to do, running and riding your uh, wave runner, etc. Those are all okay. 
and uh, the incidence of lead migration at that point is, is vastly less. Not zero, but, but vastly less. Uh, what can it and can't it do, the stimulator? The stimulator works best on nerve pain, on what we call neuropathic pain. It works less well on nociceptive pain. This is common regular pain like stubbing your toe or, or pain from a, uh, uh, an infection or uh, an injury like uh, cutting yourself. It doesn't work as well in these kinds of pains. But chronic pain from injury to a nerve, chronic pain from a nerve problem such as peripheral neuropathy or diabetic peripheral neuropathy or sciatica or chronic regional pain syndrome or a multitude of other uh, things that that cause pain, pain from a chronic nerve, pain after a surgery, for example. These do respond quite well. And the literature shows that about 80% of people who have neuropathic pain get substantive relief, often not 100%, but certainly greater than 50%. And uh, this is kind of the sweet spot. We, of course, would love everyone to get 100% pain relief from all their pain. But that's called true an analgesia or anesthesia. And that's imparts an inability to, to use functional information. You, you need to be able to feel where your hand is in space and be able to touch things and know that you're holding a glass, for example. If we got rid of all sensation, you wouldn't do well. So it does work well on, on nerve pain, not so well on, on acute pain, and then also pain that comes from traditional injury. Um, but nerve pain is especially uh, well treated. Um, why doesn't it work? This is a good question, and it, it doesn't work on everybody, for, uh, and for sometimes for a very good reason. Sometimes we ask it to do things that it can't simply do. Uh, if you, say, have a, a pinched nerve in a back from a, a bad back surgery, and then you develop concomitant arthritis of the knee, it's really not going to help the knee arthritis. And to expect that it will would be errant. It's, it's asking it to do something it's not designed to do. And, and that should be a guide in your decision making as well. If you have uh, traditional nociceptive pain, achy pain, it's usually not as well uh, termed to, or not as well set up to, to treat it. It's not going to work quite as well. Some people do have pain relief from it. Um, I've certainly had uh, instances. I had a, a patient who came back from Iraq after a bad injury to his knee, actually. Uh, an IED exploded and injured his knee in many surgeries, and he had deep uh, achy pain, knee arthritis pain, and indeed the stimulator actually worked beautifully for him. But it's not the common thing. Um, so it does work on nerve pain and, and not as well on non-nerve pain. Um, how long has it been done? That's a wonderful question, and uh, it really started around 1968, actually, when a uh, very wise neurosurgeon in uh, Wisconsin uh, implanted two uh, electrodes in the spine of a man who was dying from cancer. And uh, they put a little bit of uh, energy through the spinal canal right into the cord, actually. And this gentleman had 100% pain relief, uh, which was wonderful, obviously. And uh, sadly, he died a couple days later from a complication from his cancer. But nevertheless, that was the first time it was done, it was 1968. And so we're really actually coming up on the 50th anniversary of neuromodulation. Right prior to that, peripheral nerve stimulation had been done in 67. And since that time, uh, we've been working to try and uh, build the, the science as well as the available instrumentation uh, to 21st century standards. Uh, at first, the, the, the pulse generators were external and the leads had to go through the skin. Then in time, we were able to implant a receiver, uh, an RF receiver underneath the skin and you had to wear a battery pack around. Then uh, about a decade ago, we were able to uh, create a uh, implantable battery. Um, Medtronic was the first to do this. It's wonderful because now patients wouldn't have to wear a big bulky uh, pack in order to drive the stimulation. Then ultimately, uh, we were able to develop charging cap capability through the skin, and then multiple leads with multiple lead uh, arrays with different electrode configurations, and now, we stand really at the precipice of an extremely exciting time where neuromodulation has exploded, not only in what's available to us, but also in, in what's coming now. There are many exciting trials coming, different ways of contouring electricity, putting electricity in different neural targets throughout the body, be it the dorsal root ganglion and 
different areas of your spinal cord, peripheral nerves, brain, etc., fo focusing this, uh, this type of stimulation all over your body with often sometimes profound results. And so in, in, in final uh, uh, summation for this, this small chapter, chapter one of Neuromodulation University, neuromodulation is, is in my practice an extremely exciting thing that we do. It's extremely important. Um, I often equate the risks of neuromodulation against the risks of doing nothing and the risks of uh, opioid use. I live in Florida, and uh, recently we've been dealing with significant opioid abuse. And uh, just to give you some of the numbers, which are uh, humbling, uh, neuromodulation is, of course, digital uh, pain relief, not, uh, not drug-related, no side effects. Um, but in 2008, we had 36,000 drug-related deaths in the U.S. Contrast that to 33,000 motor vehicle accident deaths. Um, we spend $72.5 billion a year on simply... Uh, drug addiction and rehab from prescription drug abuse. To put that in context, we spend $1.3 billion on neuromodulation. Pain in general costs us around $590 billion per year. And so this is a small uh, drop in the financial bucket. In Florida, in 2008, eight patients per day died uh, from a drug overdose. And so Neuromodulation uh, presents as a very uh, um, useful tool in reducing pain for patients. It is imperfect, uh, but nevertheless, um, in, in our hands, we find that it's an often extremely beneficial, extremely useful, and, um, and enjoyable uh, practice, not only for the patients, but for ourselves. Please look forward to our rest of our, our uh, webcasts, and we're going to do 15 or 16 chapters on neuromodulation. Again, Porter McRoberts in uh, South Florida uh, giving you an education on neuromodulation. Thanks so much.